The following interview was conducted with Patricia Kantner, former head of resource services and recently retired from Purdue Libraries for the Purdue Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, February 21, 2012 in the Archives and Special Collection. Pat or Patricia, good morning and good afternoon to you. Let's good start afternoon, with um, where and well, when you were born in your early years. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio uh, in 1946 and lived there until I was five years old. And my parents uh, moved the family to Euclid, Ohio, the suburb, and that's basically where I grew up. I attended uh, St. Williams School through the eighth grade and then Regina High School uh, through high school. Tell us a little about grade school and high school. Well, yeah. was it a large school? And it was. There were, uh, of course, this was this was post-war. So these we were the baby boomers, and so there uh, there was, in fact, in the parish where my my family lived, um, they had to the they had a a uh, separate gymnasium planned for the school, and then somehow ran out of room or had to build extra to house the students. So they had to somehow move the church into what should have been the gymnasium and then use something else for, for that. Um, but yeah, we could, uh, it was definitely one of those situations where it was a, uh, you could walk to school, which we did. And, uh, um, you know, many people from our neighborhood, I mean, you, you knew a lot of people because everybody lived pretty closely in the area. Um, now, for high school, that was different. It was something like a 45-minute bus ride. Of course, it was like taking the local because they stopped along the way to pick up uh, uh, all, the, all the girls. But where uh, the, the uh, parish school was co-educational, uh, Regina was an all-girls high school. And uh, that was, uh, it was a great school. Uh, alas, it's no longer with us. Um, uh, they well, did they have the religious order? That yes, the now it didn't in in uh, grade school it was the Ursuline nuns, and in high school it was the Sisters of Notre Dame, and the school closed three years ago, I think. But again, you know, it's it's not only the cost of things, but the demographic where the people have moved, and so uh, things are not not as they were. Uh, after uh, high school, uh, I went to Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. How did you happen to select? Well, I have to say my very, very best friend in high school was a legacy from Ohio University. Her mother had gone there. And since, uh, and so we decided the two of us, you know, would, would, would apply. And we actually roomed together the first year uh, and then the second year I moved into the French language house because I was a language, foreign language major uh, and, and lived there. But anyway, yeah, that, that's how these decisions get made <laughs> sometimes. Uh, so yeah, that, um, and I was there for four years, um, majored in French with a minor in history and German and so forth. Um, and what was that, campus life like? It was um, uh, it was very lively. I did not I was not a um, uh, did not join a sorority or anything like that. But you didn't need to. I mean, there was still a, a lot of things that you could do, uh, various activities. Some of it related to the foreign language studies, various groups, you know, that explored the history and culture. But, you know, there were movie groups and arts groups, music groups. I mean, almost anything you would want, they had something, they had something for. I also worked um, in the, in, uh, mostly in the language laboratory when I was there um, at the university. Not in the library, uh, which, which many people did. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and met my husband there. He was a student there. He was a student there, and we were we were 19 years old, and that Katie apparently was that for us, <laughs> because uh, what was he? What school was he? He was he was, he was he was also in liberal arts, and at the time was a sociology uh, uh, major. Uh, so, uh, but uh, when I uh, graduated from Ohio University, 
I went to graduate school at the University of Mis Michigan for comparative literature. And uh, the, again, sort of based on the language and lit studies that I had, had been doing at Ohio University, um, my area of interest was uh, the 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment. And basically, I focused on um, French, German, and English. Uh, and uh, so got my first master's at the University of Michigan. And then uh, James and I got married and uh, moved to Athens, Ohio. And for the next five years, uh, where I worked at Ohio University Libraries, that's when I got the library job. And little did I know it at the time, um, I was, uh, I had gotten a job in a library at a very significant point in library history because in the early 1970s, uh, OCLC, uh, which had been started by Fred Kilgore in Columbus, Ohio in the, in the late 60s, um, developed an online library system. The, of course, nothing to what we have now, but he, that got started. And it was actually at Ohio University Libraries that the first send button got pushed to uh, add the first bib record and create the first set of cards, because we were still using cards then. Not by me, by, by, uh, by another, uh, another library colleague. And that was, I think, in August of 1971. Um, I was there for almost four more years and then finally decided I was getting all this wonderful experience uh, working as both a serials and monograph cataloger and thought, you know, I could really parlay this into something if I would get the professional sure. degree. So let me interrupt. What was, was your husband a student there? At the, you were both living in Athens. He, we were both living in Athens okay. and uh, no, at that point he was working at the Athens Mental Health Center. Okay. And uh, so then uh, at, at that point, um, you know, having thought about it long and hard, you know, it just seemed to make sense to get, uh, to get the library degree. And I applied to several different places, but sort of, we both sort of had a yen, I think, to go back to Ann Arbor, uh, which is a city we really enjoyed. And so um, we, ended up, uh, we ended up going back there. And it took me a couple of years to get my library degree, uh, partly because during that time I started working for mathematical reviews, uh, which was, and I think still is, based in Ann Arbor. Now, the American Math Society, uh, at least at that time, was in, in Providence, I believe, but the mathematical reviews was based in Ann Arbor. And my job was is what they called a bibliographic reference librarian, but it's not what you would think because we were basically working for a publication. So this was all part of the, you know, the editorial. The bibliograph meant that we would look at these reviews of journal articles and we had to track down and verify the bibliographic references. That the math. Yes, it was. Oh, it it was it was eye crossing work sometimes, uh, because sometimes we'd even be working with handwritten uh, manuscripts, and you know, they knew who they were talking about and what the article was, but they weren't giving very many clues. You know, so you really had yeah. to become something of a detective. And so I worked there for about a year while I finished my library degree. Um, and then started looking for the first professional position. I mean, they did consider us professional librarians because we either were on, our, we either had degrees already, or like myself, were well on our way to getting them. Um, so ended up uh, after interviewing several different places, uh, and this is where I found that my OCLC experience that I had gained while at Ohio University as a paraprofessional really was the plus that made employers very interested. Uh, because, I mean, the second master's was also of some interest for an academic position and the fact that I had foreign language and so forth um, and had taken a couple of computer courses. Um, 
but they were very interested in anybody who was used to working with OCLC because by that time it was beginning to broaden beyond Ohio and the rest of the country was picking up on it. So I got a position in technical services at the um, State University of New York College at Oswego. And I went there in 1977 and uh, was there for three years. That was a wonderful job. It was a small library, and even though they had some graduate programs, I mean, it's still uh, very undergraduate focused. And the library was one of the most user focused libraries. Uh, Ann Comerton was the director. And we all did everything, no matter what your position was. I mean, it was sort of like you had a specialty, but all of us did reference. Um, and you know, you took whatever you were you were assigned on a rotating basis could be morning, afternoon, evening, weekend, whatever. But we all took a turn. Uh, usually, a couple, at least a couple of times a week, we had stints at the reference desk, which was wonderful. And I also did library instruction, and even did tours. And so I used to joke that at least there I was what I call like you know full service bank. I was a full service librarian. And I, I, that was a very significant experience for me because it's a nice area around here. It's too. a very nice area, beautiful. Um, what it what it helped for me was give me a more well-rounded view of librarianship because you weren't just in the back room cataloging the books; you were actually interacting with the students and the faculty. And I think that was really significant. It was a good start. It was a very good start. Um, uh, and, and it's difficult, I guess, unless you work in a smaller library to get jobs like that because in, in larger institutions, you know, the larger the institution, the more specialized you tend to be. Um, so I was, uh, we were there in Oswego for three years um, until the summer of 1980. During that time, our first child uh, was born. And, and as you say, beautiful area, it was really a wonderful place to be. And the library just had such a good spirit about it. A lot of camaraderie and collegiality. Um, it's, it's, I think I still have, have very good memories of that place. Um, however, since uh, our child had arrived, we both sets of parents were in Ohio, and so we were thinking maybe we wanted to go back and be a little bit closer. So I started applying for jobs uh, again. And uh, this time, uh, after interviewing several places, uh, we ended up at Miami of Ohio in Oxford, Ohio. And I was there for six years, nearly six years. Um, and that job was, uh, again, pretty much in technical services. Um, doing uh, not only cataloging, but database maintenance and so forth. Um, and that was, a, it, was a, it was a different, it was a little bit of a larger institution. Um, and not as liberal arts focused as our school would be. Yeah, and although, yeah, it was, the, we had a, a there, it was a little broader based, yes. And there was, uh, for instance, a separate fine arts library, a separate science library. Um, but we did all the processing for, for all the libraries. Um, uh, I, we moved there, or I started there, I think, in October of 1980. Uh, and again, we were, we were there until July, the end of July, 1986. And uh, second son uh, arrived in 1983, so we were, um, we were expanding our family as I was expanding my library experience. And then in 1980, the end of 1985, I think, uh, I knew I had been there for a while and I thought, well, you know, I'm one of these people who thinks that it's probably a good idea to look around and see what's available and maybe to repot yourself every once in a while. So I started looking and uh, started, you know, as jobs came up in areas that I thought I might be interested in, we didn't really want to be too far afield because with two small children, we wanted to be able them to see their 
grandparents and aunts and uncles and so forth. Um, I ended up uh, applying or seeing an ad uh, for head of cataloging at Purdue University Libraries. And so I think it was maybe February of 1986 that I sent my application and cover letter. And in early April, I got a call from Tom Hayworth. Uh, would I like to come for an interview? So that happened in May of 1986. And then in June, I got a call from Joe Damiesi offering me the job. So, uh, which I uh, was delighted to accept. And uh, I arrived, we actually moved to West Lafayette. We uh, rented a, we were able to rent a very nice little house on Grant Street. And we moved at the beginning of August, around the 6th of August. Um, and I started work on the 28th. So we had time to get in, get settled, um, get the children in one enrolled in Burgett's uh, daycare and one in West Side Schools, Happy Hollow, and uh, before I started work and get them get them going. And here I have been. I my original thought was, well, I will come here for three to five years, <laughs> and then move on. Yeah. Tell us a little about your initial appointment, and then talk about technical services and responsibilities and things of that sort. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, my original, the original job was head of cataloging. And at that time, um, uh, Did you replace somebody? Had there been somebody that was head of cataloging or? Actually, uh, I think it, I was replacing Bill Corre. He had been head of cataloging and then he was named head of technical services. Okay. And at that time, he had an office. Uh, when I came, uh, Bill had one of the offices on the second floor in the dean's, well, then the director's suite. Um, Bill's portfolio, when he was head of technical services, it included uh, the catalog unit, the acquisitions unit, and um, I'm trying to, library, um, Trying to think what we called IT at the time. Library automation or something. Yeah, it was it was yeah the right. the uh, the auto automation group, right. and uh, that and Vince Lucas was the head at that time, and um, he had cereals too, which was included in that too, right? Cereal. No, oh, I had I oh, had, had cereals. Yeah, okay. yeah. Vince had all the um, well, really it was all the library automation stuff, which it wasn't as diversified as it is now because, again, this was back in the mid small 80s. Scale. It was very small scale. Um, however, they already had developed in-house a prototype of a, an automated library system. Right. And so they already, they already had the serials catalog. That was yes, the they did. They they, did yes, they that. did. Mm -hmm. they, had, they had that. And they made their mark on the, in the industry because there weren't many institutions at that time that had a similar one. Yeah. Um, we in that time, what they would do is they had uh, they would send we had a microfiche catalog as you remember. They would send it off periodically to Autographics, and we would get our the fiche back. And these were distributed throughout the, the library. But they had a system. Um, there was Look, which was the OPAC, and Hold Up, which was the Holdings part of that. And then that uh, got sort of reorganized and merged, and they came up with the PLUS system uh, that we had for a while. So our first iterations of an, of an online system were basically developed at Purdue. We had our own in-house, and then got notice uh, in, in 1989. But anyway, when I first came, Bill was the boss. He had these three departments. Um, so I was responsible for serials cataloging, um, monograph cataloging, pre-order searching, uh, and those. And there were about 25 or so staff just in those areas at the time. And so, um, and my office was up on the third floor uh, where uh, Charles Watkinson, the, the head of Purdue Press is now. And uh, so, and most of my time actually here, I think, was in that office. 
Um, but we, uh, and then when I got here, a new associate director I had just come two weeks before, and that was Emily Mobley. So, um, and she also was a University of Michigan grad, so we had that in common. And so we arrived within two weeks of each other. And I think the first couple years in particular, um, uh, it wasn't that we worked together that much, but we would have lunch regularly the way we do and kind of talk about kind of how we found things at the libraries and maybe what she run some ideas that she had about things by me. Well, that was in 1986. By the spring of 1987, she had started the first uh, planning uh, initiative, and it was called the Futures Committee. And uh, what our, our work eventually developed into the first strategic plan because we sort of morphed from futures into the, what they call the planning, the planning committee. Uh, so she, I think, brought kind of a new energy into, um, into the place. Uh, and we worked, a, so that was one of the things that in addition to being uh, head of the catalog unit, one of the things that took up a lot of time, I think, when we were doing the, the, um, the strategic planning initiative and that was also very good for me because it provided a way to work with some of the other uh, librarians. Um, because on, on that team, it was headed by Emily, but Barbara Penzelic was on it, Gordon Law, Richard Funkhauser, uh, Ed Posey, Mar uh, I think Mar uh, was Martha on there? I can't remember if Martha well, was on there. Been on there Laszlo was on there, Vince Lucas, and myself, Gordon Law also. I'm not sure if I said Gordon or not. Um, so uh, we met regularly, and of course then this began, we did um, a, Dick Funkhauser, Gordon Law, and I uh, took on uh, doing or developing a survey that was to three versions of which were to be sent out, one for the faculty, one for the graduate students, and one for the undergrads. And we worked on that and, and developed that and then had, of course, to write a report. Um, uh, sort of finally doing, I mean, what they might call now an environmental scan. Um, asked all kinds of questions about, you know, how people viewed the library, what they wanted from the library, how they mostly used or what resources they needed. There was another group that was interviewing the academic deans and then a third group um, actually was doing a history of the Purdue University Library. So it was sort of like how we got to where we are, where we are now, and where do we need to go. Um, and that was, that was, it was hard work. It took a long time, but I certainly think it was, it was very yeah. worth doing. And as this was going along, and then the other part of, of being the head of the catalog unit, if you remember, there was the Public Services Advisory Committee that Emily headed, or PSAC as they called it. And I was not on it, but I would, um, I would ask to be put on the agenda, as Emily said, on a pretty regular basis, because it seemed to me that I needed to be able to talk to the heads of the various libraries sure, yeah. about things that, I mean, I saw this very much as a collaborative effort um, and that we couldn't do things without consultation. So um, they knew what was coming and vice versa and you get Exactly. Boxing. And if we said, okay, here's, and they, yeah, it was a way to talk with each other. Um, you know, during when when after the academic year was officially over in May and we had started into the summer sessions, well, a reduced student population meant that the librarians had a chance to look around at projects they needed to do, inventories, weeding, and so forth. And a lot of this of course required work on the part of technical services as well to keep the records up to date to make sure things sure things got processed. And um, but 
you couldn't be very effective if there was no organization in terms of what projects you were going to work on. So that turned out to be a very good thing to be able to discuss that and set some priorities so that you, you people knew what to expect, right. I think. So that was, that was very good. And then um, once the libraries were reorganized, uh, I found myself on, you know, uh, of course we broadened it from a strictly public services oriented to the Libraries Council and then the similar, um, uh, including now the Planning and Operations Council, and I had, I've had i served on all of those since then. Right. And I think it's been very good, um, again, to get where we were all sitting at the table and talking about right. things and so forth. Um, Moving, moving back perhaps to the late 80s, uh, we had um, the sadness, of course, of Joe's last illness and, and death, and Emily's appointment as acting director, uh, and of course, as you know, uh, it, the position was, um, uh, instead of being a director position, was made a dean position because after all, the library director is a dean of the library's faculty. Um, and I was on that search committee, uh, and uh, again, very interesting experience. And Emily, of course, applied for the job and was named uh, the dean of libraries beginning in, in July 1989. And then once she took on that position, of course, we really stepped up planning and reorganization and all of that sort of thing. At that time, we also had agreed to get the notice system. Actually, I think we were told by the then, um, uh, at the state level, that all of the Indiana state libraries, uh, Purdue, IU, Indiana State, Ball State, we were all notice libraries by fiat. Uh, so we spent the next few years implementing gradually the, the notice system. Um, the next thing that started to happen as we got more and more into automation was, you know, um, when can we get rid of the card catalog? Not everybody wanted to do this. Not everybody thought it was a good idea. And I think there were similar battles fought in libraries all over uh, the country. but. It was very time consuming uh, to constantly be filing and pulling cards and so forth. <coughs> and here we were adding more and more of our holdings to OCLC and then importing them into our own notice database. Uh, so starting in 1990, we stopped getting catalog cards for the union catalogs, union catalog that was in ISSE. And that meant that people up in technical services were no longer filing catalog cards and revising them, uh, which was a great savings in time. And that continued, uh, but we were still getting shelf list cards. And gradually, you know, when, and of course, we not only had a union card catalog, but we were also getting card sets for each of the 15 libraries. And then, of course, that stopped. And finally, in 1997, I believe, or 98, we finally stopped getting shelf list cards. And that was, that was a hard sell for some of the folks also. Um, but again, yeah, and then we eventually moved everything up to the attic. Uh, you, we just didn't need the, right. the card catalog anymore. So that was, um, uh, and in increasing, uh, of course, we were increasingly we were looking for ways to streamline operations. Um, we were a pretty, I don't think we've ever had an extraordinary amount of staff in technical services here. Uh, however, when I started, we had quite a few more than, um, oh, and one thing I neglected to say is that after Emily became dean in 1989, 
uh, we started looking at libraries reorganization and in February 1991 acquisitions and cataloging were merged into one unit called technical services and I became the head of, uh, of that combined unit. The former head of acquisitions at Gedekin went to the Hissey Library as history bibliographer. And then Bill's uh, position uh, name was changed. He became, I think it was the director for technology, I think library technology. Um, so things were already beginning to change a little bit. We were doing kind of looking at staffing, um, trying to make sure that we had staff in the right places. And at that time, uh, Emily was looking for positions that she could use for document delivery. So as we began to both do more automation and then uh, also then because of that streamlined technical services processes, um, we actually were able to then give up some positions mm -hmm. at that you're point. You're talking, uh, one comment, you're talking about staff. One of the things that uh, for a long period of time, you had a lot of people doing bibliographic searching. That's right. There was a big crew of people that did that for all uh, because you had at least five or six people and it was um, pretty much by subject. And Kathleen McCullough, who headed that up, you know, she had a big crew working for her. So mm -hmm. bibliographic searching, they had to be sure before the order went through that everything had been checked very carefully. That's right. That's for the and, uh, and other this was libraries. all paper checking. You know, there was you didn't. Uh, oh yes, absolutely. You, because using the card catalog and reference sources. Reference you know. sources, Mansell. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, yeah, it it. Bowker, Ulrichs, uh, any the basic cataloging reference tools that would provide information on that particular item that was mm -hmm. being ordered. Right. Books in print, that was, oh, yeah. and of course, at that time, everything was in fact print. Yeah, exactly. uh, you you didn't you every things were not online as they are now. Um, it's just amazing to think of that that was, and it was very labor intensive. Very much so. Yeah, and lots of paper forms that, uh, you know, had to be, you know, they, they came in triplicate and quadruplicate, and, you know, this, this got filed here, and that got filed there, and there was this big on-order file uh, yeah. that, we, uh, that we had to keep. Yeah. So lots of paper. Um, we have not gone quite as paperless as one might have thought we would be by now. But compared to what we had when I started, uh, it's it's a whole different ball game. Sure, that's right. But you're quite right. Yes, I, I of course remember Kathleen very well. She retired um, a year or so after I came, but I always enjoyed talking yeah. to Kathleen. You can talk. Let's talk about the acting assistant dean. When you what was that? That sort of flows into what you were talking about. That well, you know, and it's of course I like to joke that I came here in 1986 for three to five years and then thinking that you know you need to broaden your experience so you go elsewhere. Well, I haven't had to go elsewhere because things have changed so much and my responsibilities have changed so much over the years. Um, but this was, uh, becoming the acting assistant dean was, uh, a, a, it was a, an interim or temporary thing. Um, uh, Emily uh, Mobley uh, stepped down as dean, I guess officially, at the end of 2003, but as you recall, the first six months of 2004, uh, she stepped down one day as, as uh, it was almost like on a Friday as, as the dean and came back as the acting dean uh, while we looked for uh, a replacement. And then uh, Jim Mullins was appointed uh, that uh, that spring and started as of July 1. Um, and uh, at that time, Cheryl Kern Simarenko was the associate dean, and her responsibility, her responsibility really was the day-to-day -day running of the library, of the libraries, because she had both public services and collections in her, in her portfolio. And uh, 
so uh, Cheryl was here for the first year of, of Jim's tenure, and then she accepted a position as uh, Dean of Libraries at the University of Akron. So she left in August of 2005, and uh, in the meantime, when we knew that she was, she was leaving, Jim asked if I would uh, be willing to assume responsibility for the collections portion of, of her responsibility. He had decided, I think, that once Cheryl was leaving, his thought was to split the position into two, with one being public services and one being Correct. collections. And um, to that end, um, uh, in, uh, I, I, I took over in 2005 for the collections portion, and then, and Jim sort of did the, the public services portion of that for a while, but then in 1986, or 1986, 2006, um, Mary Ann Ryan was hired as the Associate Dean for Public Services. Um, and we, uh, and I, you know, and so, and in the meantime, uh, Jim had asked, originally we thought this was just gonna be for a few months until he could hire um, an AD for collections. Um, but then he said, well, how about doing it for a year? And then it was, how about two years? And it was fine with me because I thought that gave him time. We also were, um, uh, we needed a new associate dean for technology or information technology. And so we had that search going on. And so I thought, okay, this gives Jim time to get the rest of his team assembled and and then, um, but that was a, um, it was very challenging because I of course still had technical services, but really working with the collections was just wonderful. Um, I enjoyed it very, very much. One of the initiatives, um, you know, acting or not, that, uh, you know, at that point we knew we had to um, reduce the number of print subscriptions that we were getting. So one of the initiatives that I got going on um, while I was in that position uh, was to look at some of our big publishers and work with um, the Information Resources Council, which I headed up at that time, and the, all the collections, the bibliographers and the collections mm -hmm. people, to figure out where we would be able to cut um, and go from print only or print plus electronic to uh, electronic. And we started with the big ones like Elsevier, Springer, um, and that group, Wiley, um, and then did a second round where we tried to pick up some more publishers. And then that, of course, has been continued yes, since right. then. We've had other, um, but, you know, again, this, this really denotes another sea change in how we get information right. uh, because people really do, our faculty and students, the more we can deliver online, I mean, that's really the exactly. way they want exactly. it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. A um, couple things that we did want to ask you. A couple activities we don't have anymore. The book sale. That's right. And also, well, you talk about the card camp, but the book sale was a tradition thing we had for a long, long time. And some years you did pretty well, although I know that Kathy Garns and we bring back the same book. Some just didn't sell. <laughs> That's right. I know. Yeah. I know. It, it, well, it, it changed. It was a big job. It was a big job, and, and really, uh, Katie, part of it, I thought uh, for a while, I mean, that it was really, we never really made money. If you add up the cost to us of moving and storing the things that were withdrawn, bringing them down, uh, you know, arranging them, displaying them, uh, selling them. Staffs. The staffing that had to, that had to occur for that to happen. Um, we had to pay for ads in the Exponent, and uh, right. I think the Journal and Courier was through. We had to pay for an ad in the Exponent for, you know, for publicity. We had to pay the room rental. You know, any moving that had to be done, you know, that, that uh, cost Very us. high expense. It was very high. I mean, you know, and, and it's true that we would eventually take in several thousand dollars each year that went 
back into the, the Dean's Fund in the collections area. So we were recycling that so that we could buy newer materials. But as, as far back as Emily, I mean, it was pointed out to me that we're not, this is a, this is a really a loss, <laughs> a total loss. However, it was a, an event that I think our faculty and students used to look forward to. Uh, dealers would look forward to it, and when we opened uh, at 8 o'clock the first morning of the sale, there would usually be a long line of people waiting. However, things changed over time. Um, what we found is uh, it, it got to be less of a happy community event and a, I think um, a little, little sense of entitlement crept in. The dealers, uh, they, they wanted to know if uh, the, well, some of the faculty and students didn't want dealers there. And some of the dealers didn't want, you know, they wanted to come in before the students. And, you know, we always held the position, no, we're opening at the same time and it's everybody. Well, what changed was, you know, you'd have your usual book dealers who would come. We knew who they were and so forth. But, uh, and, and I think the internet really helped this. We actually have faculty and students here at Purdue who were doing a little book dealing themselves, which was, you know, so, and it got to the point where, again, we were looking at how much work we had to put into this for what we were getting out of it. And in common, again, with another, a number of universities, um, just decided that it wasn't worth sure. it at that point. What, do you, what, are, what are you doing? Are you still accepting gift books, though? Or do you still have the G&E? Are you accepting? It is much reduced. Okay. I mean, you're we, much more selective. It is much more selective, partly uh, because we are not we are not collecting as much print anymore. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I you know, if I had to hazard a guess, I think I mean certainly we have print in special collections sure. with along with a lot of other things, and that will probably continue to be the case. And I think. Uh, Perhaps for the foreseeable future, you know, you're going to have print in hissy because that, to some extent, is 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 not only you know book as content, but also book as artifact in terms of you compare you know literary studies, you compare editions, right. and you do that sort of thing. But for the rest of the libraries, the sure. the print collections are getting leaner and leaner, and. We are finding that when we go to sell um, our runs of periodicals, you know, everybody else is going electronic too. You don't get the takers that you used to sure, have. Right. So the, the, that that's changing. Right. Quite a bit. Yeah. You had a lot of. We talked a little bit about some of the councils and the tertiary uh, planning and search committees. Let's talk about your professional associations, ALA and the Indiana. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, at ALA, I. Uh, did work with the um, a, a group which has the unfortunate nickname of Meatheads. It is the uh, technical services directors of medium-sized academic libraries, and uh, I chaired. I uh, was on the um, uh, the planning group for that, the steering committee, and chaired that. And we would do uh, we would we would plan. It was supposed to be a discussion group, but we would also plan programs. And when, in the late 90s, which was when I was working on this, I thought, were well, there are things I want to know about, and I'll bet other people do as well. And so what was a, uh, a big movement at that time, the old notice mainframe system was aging. And people were looking around, as we were, to see what else was out there on the market that might be more suitable for what we needed. And so one of the things that I plan was I contacted uh, both librarians and in the vendors we did a program on you know how what to look for in choosing your next automated system and people talked about what their process had been you know why they had made the choices they made and so forth and we had vendors uh, come in and talk as as well so you tried to make it relevant uh, so that uh, it 
uh, it, all ALA meetings always aggravate me when they have some catchy title and then the the uh, and prove to be more style than substance. So you know, I wanted to be sure that you know, if, at least when I was doing it, that we had you a can lot of substance. We could deliver the substance right, yeah. as well. So we didn't get people coming in for you know five minutes, ten minutes, looking disgusted, and then leaving again to to find a meeting. So I did that. Uh, I also was active in the Indiana Library Federation. Including a term as president. For a number of years, yes, I served, um, was a elected, and I had worked with the technical services group there and chaired that. Uh, I had worked on the conference planning group. I had also worked on the executive committee of the Indiana Academic Library Association, which was one of the groups for which uh, ILF was the umbrella. And then, um, uh, was asked to uh, in the late night to run for uh, well it's running for president you basically would serve a it was a four-year sequence you were second vice president first vice president president and then past president and each of those roles had its own responsibilities um, but the uh, uh, to my delight, my, my presidency sort of straddled from 1999 into 2000, which I got a big kick out of. The, the, one of the best parts of it, though, was in that role, I had to travel to district meetings all over the state. And that was wonderful, driving all over Indiana and getting to know the, um, uh, not only the other academic librarians, because I knew some of them, but the public libraries around the state, the special librarians. So it gives you a much more comprehensive view of what's going on, you know, um, at the school and public right, level. Yeah. So that was, that was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of work, a lot of driving, but it was, uh, it was a very rewarding experience. Uh, and then I was asked to run for OCLC Members Council um, to be one of two people who represented in Colsa uh, to, or at, at OCLC. And um, I first was elected as an alternate uh, delegate and did that for one year and then was elected uh, to my own term and did that for three years. So that was from 2000. Five um, through 2009, mm. and that was also a wonderful yeah, experience I because there you worked with librarians um, not only from all over the country but internationally as right. well, made a lot of contacts, really were able to keep up on what was happening in the profession from that point of view. So. Those were those were really yeah. rewarding experiences. What about CIC? What was your involvement? Did you in CIC? Uh, I uh, was on the uh, technical services directors group, and I chaired that group for a year or so in the late nineties. Um, and you know, it was it was these 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 groups, uh, tech services, the collection development people, and other other groups they're peer groups and so it's very helpful because if you want information on what's going on I mean we, we did some initiatives together mm -hmm. as well but it's um, you know this is a long-standing consortium and so there is a lot of information that flows back sure, and forth right. so that was very good um, later on they formed a head of they formed a cataloging group and acquisitions group we had people and still do to handle the cataloging part, but I kind of picked up the acquisitions because there was not a professional library in that area. Um, and then for the years that I was the uh, acting associate dean, I was on the uh, collection development officers group as well. So I used to kid Jim. I said, I think I'm going to ALA and just working for the CIC, you know, because that's where we <laughs> met. But those, again, the, um, you know, just the communication, sharing information. And, and the contacts. Yeah, the contacts were wonderful. And the group, I mean, they've been doing some very good things um, at the time that I left. You know, they were setting up this shared print repository. And they've been doing um, some other collaborative work that goes across the various groups, which has been really good right. to see. Uh, fact fellow, were you ever a fact fellow, faculty fellow when you were here at all? No, because I was never a faculty member. Oh, but they have some st some staff. I know the number. Um, family. Let's talk about your family. You have 
husband and a couple children? Yes, I do. Uh, both the, the um, uh, my husband James works for the Lafayette School Corporation, and we have two children, um, uh, Justin and Joe, both of whom are Purdue graduates. Uh, Justin graduated from the School of Liberal Arts with a degree in psychology in 2000, and Joseph from the School of Agriculture. Um, in the, he was in the Natural Resources and Environmental Science program, graduated in 2005. Um, uh, Justin went on later then to get a master's from IU and a PhD from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And he is currently um, uh, a postdoc at the uh, University of, of California, Santa Barbara, and is uh, married and, and has uh, well, at this point, one child, but possibly by the time we finish this conversation, it could be two. We don't know. Uh, and so he um, uh, really credits the uh, some of the people in the psychology department uh, at Purdue with, uh, and he is still in contact with uh, with some of those those folks uh, for getting him off to a good start. And. Um, uh, our younger son, uh, Joe, is, lives now in Berkeley, California, and he is working on a PhD uh, in uh, the energy resources group out there. Okay, sounds so, good. Uh, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? My favorite Purdue tradition, this will probably not surprise you because of my being a Purdue mom, but I think the way Purdue does its graduations, I think, is just wonderful. Um, there is so much emphasis on the students, you know, and of course, by extension, their families. But it's kind of a family celebration. They don't necessarily go for the they don't go for the big name speakers and all of that. The focus is very much on the students, and um, e even with the undergrads. And you know, when we, we graduate classes in the high, you know, in the thousands, everyone walks across that stage uh, to get. A degree and a, and a handshake, and I, I, I think that's wonderful. I, I hope they never stop. They it. do a good job, and there are very few schools today that are still doing giving you the diploma and things. So it's kind of outstanding event. Boy, you can have more than one. Sometimes people say, "Well, anything special?" It's you know I, I was thinking about that. You know what. Um, I think there have been so many things happening. It's sort of like if you blink, you've you've okay. uh, you've missed uh, something. Well, maybe you could incorporate that. I think I'm going to leave for the last one that reflection. Is that now that you've finished, what are your plans? Ten, eight, ten. I ten. think um, uh, probably to to travel. Um, we I plan to to stay in the. We, we will be we will be staying for for at least for the time being for the foreseeable sure. future in in this community, which you know we have lived here now uh, almost twenty six years. Mm -hmm. um, no, actually almost twenty seven, and um, it it was a wonderful place to be to work to raise a family, um, and and we still enjoy what it has to offer. Um, uh, we are theater buffs, both of us, and we enjoy both the Civic Theater and the Purdue University mm -hmm. Theater. Uh, so, and I think certainly to maintain our connections with the university and, and our, our involvement there, I think, as well as perhaps to get more into the community side of things. Right, okay. But lots of opportunities here. I know. Anything in closing that I forgot to ask or anything you'd like to say? Gosh, Katie, this has been a trip down memory lane. I well, think, it's been uh, it's been very very helpful and uh, very informative, and and it's nice that you're going to be able to stay on in the community, and uh, it'll keep you busy. It it will. You know, I know that some, and I'm sure you got asked this question. <laughs> but what are you going to do? You know, everybody gets everybody that question. gets that question. Right, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? And I'm thinking, uh, I'll tell you as as now I'm I'm uh, only three weeks into this retirement uh, career. We'll have to do a follow-up uh, in another yeah, year. in another year. But yeah. I'll tell you, the days are flying by as quickly as they ever did. That's right. Exactly. And there is no dearth of things to do. That's right. So, um, uh, well, Pat, I really, on behalf, I want to thank you very much. It's been very nice. Well, I've enjoyed it as well, My Katie. pleasure. Thank you very much for <laughs> asking.